Hey everybody, it's Pastor Ryan here with you today with a special encourager this week coming to us from the Gospel of St. Luke. I don't know what it's like for you, but on occasion I go to those places in Scripture that have some of my favorite, most familiar stories, and while I'm there at the familiar stories, there are always these other parables, uh, teachings, ministry moments and miracles of Jesus that are kind of sprinkled in between. Some that could be familiar, others that maybe just because of the topic haven't been dug into in some time. Either way, we're on the road with Jesus. Uh, for my part, especially in my personal devotional life, I went to Luke chapter 8 to look at a parallel account of a time where Jesus calms the storm. And it's right after that story in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus heals a man who is otherwise demon-struck and he exercises those demons, he casts them out and then gives the man, again, the only perhaps charge, the only word given to the man himself after he addresses the demons that are within. Uh, for you today, as you hear this story, I would challenge you to think about, say, a person's charge and testimony according to what God has done for them, thinking already now about how you might tell what God has done for you, and maybe from the place of putting ourselves in the shoes of the demon-possessed man, what it is at times to, one, admit that we're blessed, and then second, uh, to admit to others in our testimony that, yes, even the likes of us are in need of God's great mercy. Hear the word of the Lord from Luke chapter 8. We're beginning at verse 26 and we're going all the way through verse 39. This is the story. They sailed for the country of the Gerasenes, which was opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. From a long time he had worn no clothes, he had not lived in a house, but he lived instead among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. He had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard, he was bound with chains and with shackles, but he would break those bonds and be driven out by the demon into the desert. And so Jesus asked him, What is your name? He responded, Legion, for many demons had entered him. So then they begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. There was a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside, and they begged Jesus to let him enter these. So he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man, and they entered the pigs, and then the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and they were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the countryside. So then people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed again, and now in his right mind. They were sore afraid of the sight they saw. Those who had seen the event told how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And so then all the people from the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them because they were seized with a great fright. So he got into the boat and he returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with Jesus, but Jesus sent him away from him saying, Return to your home and declare just how much God has done for you. And so the man went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Now this is a rather beautiful story. Maybe it is from a place of strange and peculiar. Um, yes, even I too remember something of this story with the demons that were cast into the herds of pigs. You might wonder for a moment how that might have um, affected the livelihood of the pig herders. Nonetheless, you see their response to go into the town and to cover the countryside and to tell the great stories of this miracle that had been worked. That before and after moment is also important to see how much this man had suffered where demons were coming and going, and even at times perhaps where they were cast out, it was as if to say the man's mind and heart and soul were completely clean and laid bare so that other demons could 
kind of just go right along in as he may have invited them to do so. To not be able to make any homestead in his community, but to live among the graves, and to the point where he might have been such a threat or caused such a great fear in society that he was bound and chained and shackled. There's so much bound up in this man that, um, could you say it this way, a slave to sin, a slave to death, a slave to the powers of hell, and yet still being able to cry out to the one and only master who would be able to liberate him from all of these bonds. Now, what's crucial in the wake of the miracle is not just the response of the herdsmen and not just the response of the townspeople and those who might have even known the man very well. But to see just how much in the great wake of fear in society the man desperately wanted to be on the road with Jesus as if to say, Lord Jesus, make me one of your disciples, let me be with you. At this moment in scripture, as the Gospels have foretold, even the likes of those who are under the earth, those who are in the spiritual realm, those who are on the side of evil, know exactly who Jesus is and what he's come to do. As Jesus proclaims that type of forgiveness and restoration, um, and you could say, uh, in a sense there too, just, um, um, uh, my goodness, his ability to loose the bonds of prisoners, as was foretold in the Old Testament, Jesus is definitely doing the things that only God himself, only the Messiah, is charged to do, and that comes with a great weight of needing to respond. Because Jesus sees the need of the man to respond, he says, don't cling to me, instead go, and in a sense, give testimony. Be a witness, be a living reminder of what the Lord has done for you. And so the man followed suit, and he went on to witness. I would challenge you as you hear this story to think of the ways that you too may witness for God, the ways that you may recount what God has done, and not simply as it lives in the pages of scripture, but as it has affected you personally. One way to have exercises of testimony is to do almost like a little fill in the blank. To say, for instance, I know that God showed me mercy when fill in the blank. Perhaps you it was a moment of reward or a moment of healing. A moment where you saw clearly that there was something placed upon you that wasn't deserved. Or more importantly, from a place of mercy, to count the number of things that may have been withheld from you when you did deserve them. Or maybe it is to say from another place of mercy and grace to recount the way that God has been patient with you. You know, celebrating how patient and long-suffering God's love is, as if to say God has been so patient, he did fill in the blank for me. Now, testimony can be otherwise uncomfortable for some Christians just because it isn't really part of our muscle memory. We often like to be present to hear the word of the Lord and then to respond to his love by telling God how much we love him back. We can echo that same love in our testimony, but perhaps apart from things like sharing a story of redemption, the most difficult part of testimony is admitting that we're objects of God's grace, that we need a measure of his patience, that as he gives us the blessing of strength and providence and everything that we could possibly need until we reach heaven shore, we admit that we need mercy too. Imagine this demon-possessed man, or can we say now, once demon-possessed man, to celebrate that the Lord Jesus was able to fully and finally complete his work to restore the man, part of that testimony the man would have needed to admit that at one time he was filled with demons. I don't know what it's like for you, but to move from that place of discomfort and distress because of the power that sin has over us, ignoring those invitations to be on the side of evil and embracing what our Lord and Savior Jesus has to offer, yes, it can be uncomfortable to mention those moments where we must be the object of God's grace and mercy, but oh, what joy to celebrate then not only the present but the eternal reward that is ours when we see and sense that Jesus is near and what he has availed for us by his own sacrifice.
In so many ways, this reflects perhaps Abraham's call in the way that we are blessed to be a blessing. My prayer for you today is that you might go on to bless others, yes, perhaps with physical and earthly things that would meet their needs. It's good to feed the hungry. It's good to give charity and alms to the poor. But we can also add to that the joy of the confession of Christ, blessing others by sharing the ways that God has blessed us. We become a conduit of God's grace. We become a conduit of his mercy. We become effectively a pass-through of all of those blessings that, yes, come to bless us, pour over us, and wash into the lives of others. May God bless you as you celebrate the way that you once were, but now are in Christ, called to be his own, and certainly celebrating the blessings as a fellow child of God. To him be all glory. We'll see you soon. God's peace and good health to you today. Bye-bye for now.